Oh, it's my first time out squirrel hunting ever, my whole life. I thought it'd be a new experience to put some food on the table, and I've already got myself in a pickle. I uh, shot a squirrel and it's stuck up in the tree. I don't know how I'm gonna get this out. <laughs> what luck. Ah, oh, I got out of the tree. Ah. There we go. Well, at that range, I guess I didn't really want to hit it anyway. All right, guys, we've got ourselves a black squirrel. Uh, there's also grays in this area. Both are open right now. There's no difference between the two that I know of. Uh, I'm gonna show you, well, I'm gonna tell you about two different ways to skin a, uh, a skunk. I'm still on the skunk. I'm Skin. We did we did skin a skunk, by the way. If you want to watch that, go ahead. Uh, but there's two different ways to skin a, a squirrel, and like I said, I'm not going to show you either one. But I'm going to refer you to uh, look them up. One is uh, simply cutting along the back. Put your knife through. I've got myself a little Grohman uh, mini skinner, is what it's called. I'm sponsored by Grohman. It's a good knife. If you're looking for a knife, Canadian knife made out of Nova Scotia, they sent me a pile. Uh, pile of knives to test out, so I'm going to try them out over the coming months. So anyways, you just pinch the back, puncture through, grab either side and pull, and then you just separate the feet and the head. So you're kind of like pulling a, a sock down one way, sock down the other way. And then the other method is called the tail method. So for that method, you grab the tail here, and then you would separate the legs, and you would cut uh, along the side of the tail here, all the way down, a little bit of the leg on one side, a little bit of leg on the other side, and then you would step on the tail, and then you would pull on the feet, and that would separate all the way down, and then you would just continue on forward. I'm gonna try both methods. If I get another squirrel, I'm gonna try the other method, and I'm gonna let you know which one I prefer. It's a skill that I think that all boys should learn. Um, all young men out there, if you guys are watching and you're, you're wondering whether or not you should go out and, and hunt and, and uh, cook wild game, I, I, I encourage you to do it. I encourage you to take your buddies out with you. Uh, go ask for landowner permission. I'm sure they'd be happy to get rid of some of these squirrels. There's, there's a lot of them, probably too many. 
and uh, cook them up with your buddies. It's a, it's really a great way to bond and it's a very natural way for young men to bond. And it's something that's sorely missing in our society where we have lots of indoor spaces for people, but we don't have very many safe outdoor spaces for our young men. So get off the computer, guys, go. I'm giving you permission to pick up a gun and go out. And if you can't pick up a gun, use a slingshot. Talk to your parents, show them this video, tell them I said it's okay for you to go out and it's gonna produce a more well-rounded, better adjusted person who's not in trouble. All right, guys, go out, go, please. Anyway, I got some work to do. We're both in. All right, I basically got one chance in the bow drill fire because I have one notch and it's already burnt in, half used. And that's it for my fireboard. So you have no other fire starter? No other fire starter. If I don't get this, we eat raw squirrel. <laughs> Just steady breath. That's it. Just like that. Good. Keep going. You're good. Harder. Okay. Good part. Hey guys, since uh, shooting this, I got a, managed to get another squirrel and uh, before I put this out there, I wanted to address something with uh, the viewer and they might wonder why bother shooting squirrels. They're so small and there's so little meat on them. Well, I'm gonna answer for you. 
As uh, hunters, we are in charge of managing the wild population. If we don't manage the wild population, it gets out of control. And uh, you might think that's a good thing. Lots of wildlife is good, right? But the incidence of contact between wildlife increases. And so they start sharing diseases between and amongst themselves. So if they get to a certain carrying capacity, uh, a disease can wipe out a larger amount of them. Um, just because they're, they act as vectors and they're transferring from one person or from one, one animal to the next. So the disease spreads really quickly if there's too many of them. And I say too many, literally. There, there can literally be too many squirrels. Uh, the next thing is, uh, as overcrowding becomes an issue with squirrels, um, they put a lot of stress on not only the, themselves and the population, um, you know, but on the environment. So by reducing the population, it's more likely that the, the population will be healthy and stress and less stress on themselves because more uh, they'll be competing less against others and they'll also be taking less from the environment. And we know squirrels are seed dispersal mechanisms, but if there's a lot of them, um, then there's a lot of stress on the, on the seed and on the plants and the vegetation and fewer of them will get dispersed and forgotten about because each squirrel is working more aggressively to take them and so they end up getting eaten instead of planted. So as sportsmen, we are doing a job here to reduce the population to make the overall population healthier. And without doing that job, um, then it, it becomes a problem for the entire population. So I wanted to frame why we hunt squirrels in case you're uh, new to squirrel hunting and you're wondering if you should do it or not and uh, why we're doing it. So there you go. Squirrel hunting is a good thing, as is all hunting, because it helps balance the population. And as top predator, that's our duty. Hey guys, so we got the mortar pestle. We're gonna fire that up. We've got corn. This is uh, regular cow corn. Uh, it's like the lowest quality corn you can get. It's all pre-dried. This is what they feed to cattle, livestock, etc. Um, thing is, as it stands right now, it's impossible to uh, pestle it down. Or not impossible, it takes a lot of work. So what I'm going to do is parch it. And that just means I'm just going to put it, no oil, no nothing on the bottom of this cast iron. Throw it in the heat and stir it around till it darkens or browns. And uh, just before, just shy of it turning black. And then we'll pull it out and we'll put it in our uh, mortar pestle and we'll work it down till it's a fine uh, paste or powder I should say, and then we're gonna add water to that and turn it into a gruel. And uh, you can work it really, really fine until it gets, you know, to the point where it's almost like corn flour. But uh, I've, in my experience using this, it's very difficult to get it to that, to that level of grind. So just something basic, just to make a basic kind of famine type food, food famine type food. So our squirrel has been in a brine uh, I use my regular, the Wooded Beardsman adobo spice. Some people say it's not adobo spice. Adobo spice is just a generic term. But uh, this is a mixture of four, four or five different spices with some salt. And the brine over time helps make the meat a lot more uh, ready to accept moisture and flavor. So that's been uh, drained out. Most of the brine's already been drained. And all I'm gonna do is Throw it in a pot, add a little bit more water, and then we're going to boil that until it's pretty much cooked. And then we'll pull it out and we'll give it a sear on the fire just to add that little bit more flavor and uh, add a little bit more spices at the same time, some oil uh, and some butter just to give it some extra flavoring. So that goes on the fire next.
that's all the hard work done. Now, I've got myself two little zucchinis from the garden and uh, <laughs> my zucchini just escaped. Uh, this is a traditional Native American food. This is not a traditional Native American tool. Carrot peeler. We are going to carrot peel these zucchinis. I'm going to get rid of the skins first. And then after we've gotten rid of the skins, I'm going to continue to peel it into nice long strips into cast iron pan. And we're going to fry it in some butter and also some maple sugar. And as you know, the maple sugar came from this very property. Tell everybody what we learned about squirrels today. As soon as you go near them, they just run away. Take off. You can't find them anymore. <laughs> How many do we see for like four hours of walking? Uh, three. No, two. Yeah, three. No, yeah, because we saw so we saw one here. We got one here. Yep. We didn't get a single one. Nope. We got close though to one or two. No, to one, because remember you like right through. Yeah, I should have shot, but I didn't. Famous spice, the WB spice. Odobo, right? TWB. Odobo? No, we're just calling it TWB now. BB? TWB spice, because people don't like me calling it adobo, because adobo is something but nothing at the same time. So, what do we need? Uh, Oil. Let's just. Oil them up. Here. Oil them up and then we'll spike them. There we go. Something like that. I don't got cover. The legs, the torso. Then we're gonna sear it. Right, buddy? <laughs> so we're gonna do cornmeal, gruel, and strawberries. You don't want the stem in there, do you? Big chunks. Okay, pass me another one. Come sit. You're not in the picture. Can't nobody can see you. Okay, so we got. Oh, that's way too much. <laughs> I told you to put it in, but look how much there is. Yummy. There's so much in there. Here, have a peek of that. Stir it around. Yummy. How's that look? I hope it doesn't taste bad if we use all that maple sugar. It tastes way faster than me. Hey, look at that big skin in there. What skin? Alright, we're gonna put it back on for a second. Heat it up and let the hey, one second, boy. sugar come out. So, what are you looking forward to the most there, buddy? Yeah, because I can't see you. Squirrel? Because you, you're hoping it's going to be as good as a muskrat? It looks exactly like a muskrat. Yeah, we did exactly. muskrat catch and cook before. Exactly right here. It looks exactly the same. Except we, we, cooked it, we cooked it the same way, prepared it the same way. Zucchini, he doesn't like anyway, so probably not going to eat that. Um, and this is cornmeal gruel. I've made this before with the mortar pestle. It's cow corn. It's like the lowest quality corn you can possibly buy. It is uh, famine food. Do you know what famine, famine means? When people were starving and they had no food, they would eat corn. So it's why wouldn't they just eat the cow instead of the corn? <laughs> because they didn't have animal husbandry, which means they didn't have 
animals. They didn't have domesticated animals. They grew lots of corn. Why can't they kill a dinosaur? They weren't people weren't alive during dinosaurs. Anyway, stop. I'm gonna stop you there. <laughs> so they ate corn. That's what they ate corn. Okay, they planted corn and they ate corn. Dinosaurs. They didn't eat dinosaurs. <laughs> okay, so you want to try that first? See if you like it. Here, I'll tell you if you're gonna like it. I'll try it first. So this is the mortar pestle. It's like it's like a corn-based cereal. With lots of chunks in it. Blow on it. Hot. Hot. It was gonna fall. Blow. Pretend it's like an oatmeal cereal. Is it bad? No. It's just not great. Oh. Hot. <laughs> Piece of strawberry. I'm burning. Ah. It, it's much better when you have a piece of strawberry in there. Yeah. It tastes much better. I think I didn't put enough strawberries in it for the amount of corn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you like this stuff cooking, check out our porcupine video. We did similar sort of things. We <coughs> turned it into bread. And a gruel, I believe. Like it? Not bad, right? Not bad. Well, there you go. It's edible. Oh, yeah. <coughs> you keep saying that. I'll find you something that's not edible. Obviously. Boy. Squirrel? Alright, I'm gonna grab a leg. Hey, you didn't cheers it. It tastes exactly like the muskrat. Cheers. To squirrel. This tastes exactly like the muskrat. It's got all the same seasoning, so it should. It's a little chewier, though. Yeah? Much chewier. Uh, ow. Maybe it needs a little bit more salt in the brine. Because the, the brine I used was regular, the Wooded Beardsman brand adobo spice. And it's not a salt-based. And I fainted after. Yeah, we... Um, I cleaned the squirrel in the kitchen so Holden could watch and he actually <laughs> he left the room and he blocked out for two seconds. So there you go. Ugh. I told you it was squeamish. Yeah. So this is good but chewy so I think it needs a bit more salt in the brine or longer. But it's good meat. Good meat, right? Third favorite. The <laughs> third favorite meat. Oh, next steak time. Steak is my fourth. Steak. Next time we'll try uh, a little bit more salt in the brine. First in place is um, Ow. roast beef. Second, muskrat. Third. Why can't I even. Oh, squirrel. And fourth, a steak. Alright, we're gonna wrap it up there. No, don't wrap it up. Why? Right. People wanna keep us, keep watching this eat. It's crazy. They wanna go eat now. We made them hungry again. I can have a video where you have something yummy. It's true. Alright, good? Good. See ya. We'll do another one. P.S. Some, if, if you are one of those people, please don't put up your Christmas lights before it's even December. Did you fart? <laughs> I always do, I, I heard you fart. I'm going to do it again. Oh. <laughs> What's up? Except they wouldn't recommend this for breakfast, dinner, or lunch. I would recommend this for a little snack. And don't go like um 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 um. It's in your bar. It's funny, as soon as I turn the camera on, a little red squirrel starts going. I, uh, I did manage to get another squirrel from my efforts. 
Um, okay, so since uh, shooting the squirrel episode uh, with my son, um, I've been getting a lot of comments and uh, I'm, I'm almost to the point where I can't keep up with the comments. So this may become a regular thing with the channel. I may be doing a sort of chill side chat to talk about some of the issues that are going on with the channel and uh, to connect more with the viewers and to answer in a more broad stroke fashion some of the questions and comments that I get. Uh, today I want to deal with masculinity. Um, I just got a few anecdotes I want to share and a few comments that I'd like to share too. I think some of the most worrying con comments that I get are from young men who insist that I don't hunt and that I'm cruel and what I'm doing is taking too much from the environment. Uh, I think that's a foolhardy argument. I think it's a, it's a, a weak position and uh, I'm going to try to explain why I think that's so. And I want to encourage you guys to explore your masculinity and part of that is to go out into nature, procure things and bring them home for your family and if you're just a young man for yourself and uh, when you get to the point where you have a large enough bounty you'll be able to share that with your girlfriend or your wife or your or your family as you're growing up a lot of young boys now are not getting the opportunity to go out in nature and uh, they're not getting to go out and hunt and fish and to me i think that's one of the greatest travesties of our current culture is kids that are so disconnected from their environment that they don't understand what we're doing. And, uh, you know, I heard a stat recently that 95% of the adult population don't hunt right now. 5% uh, hunt. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big statistic. Uh, but hunting has a favorable rep, uh, reputation right now at, at 50%, even though people don't hunt. I mean, that's a pretty big milestone. So we need to keep it there. Um, so what I want to address is the, the assault that young boys and young men have been having in recent years. Um, if you're under 30, you've been experiencing this in your entire life. Uh, thankfully, I'm older than 30 and I've had a pretty uh, relatively normal upbringing. I was allowed to explore and go out into nature, big wide distances. Like we're talking two kilometers under the age of nine, uh, 10 and nine. We would go out raspberry picking we would get to mess around in nature and make fires. Yeah, we got into trouble, but that was part of being a, a normal boy. Uh, these days we have zero policy, uh, zero uh, tolerance rules where kids are getting in trouble and, or boys are getting into trouble for normal boy behavior. Um, one example I'd like to bring up was uh, a kid in the US who was uh, suspended, a young kid, young boy, uh, for chewing a Pop-Tart into a pretend gun um, this is normal guys. I know uh, we have uh, lots of gun violence right now in, in terms of mass murders, but these kids understand the difference. These young boys understand the difference between a pretend gun and a real gun. What's, what's concerning to me is that adults don't understand the difference between a fake gun and a real gun. Or, and or, they think that boys don't understand the difference between real and pretend. Boys get it. Boys are really, really smart and they have very active and very um, elaborate internal uh, pretend worlds that they go through. And if you sit there and watch a boy for long enough, you'll see that. Uh, my son, is, as any other boy, uh, grew up with a love for war. Uh, he would make pretend battle and uh, he, you know just sitting there listening to him I, I was amazed at all the creativity he put into these little battles and how he'd set up his little guys and then they would go in and destroy each other and uh, to some people I'm, I mean to maybe single mothers that may be concerning like my boy's gonna grow up and he's gonna be a killer I hope so I hope your young boy grows up to be somebody who can go out into nature command nature kill and bring back to his family and provide these kinds of skills that boys have inherit in their genes and in their DNA to procure from nature and control nature are what are going to make them successful in life. And maybe the rules have changed and we don't have to go out and kill, but we do have to go out and actively compete against other young boys and men when we're older. And if you're a boy who's not able to compete against other men and, and be aggressive, you will be a failure. And society won't tell you to go out and be aggressive. But uh, let me tell you uh, another story. I'm, I coach young boys on a hockey. Currently, 
uh, the cohort is age eight with my son. And I can see a lot of potential in some of the boys, but they get stifled. Um, they're stifled because we tell boys to share. We tell everybody to share. And that's a mistake, especially when it comes to life. You can share your excess, but the primary concern for a boy and a young man is to take. Because if a boy does not take, he cannot share. And nobody will share with him, or very few people. A boy who doesn't take is a boy who doesn't have access. And a boy who doesn't have access, have access is a boy who will not attract a girlfriend. He will not get married. And he will not be able to support a family. Boys must first take. And the best kind of taking is from nature because it's not a zero-sum game. You don't have to take from other people in order to provide to people. You can take from nature fish, animals, uh, and if you're not into that sort of thing, that's fine. I'm not going to tell you you have to do that. You can go out and collect apples, blueberries, strawberries, burdock. I mean, the list goes on. Walnuts, like we've done all these things on the channel. And those are meals you can provide for your family. Um, later on in life, you're going to be expected to procure money. And if you don't, that's going to be a problem for you because you will not, su not survive in this, in this kind of environment. So aggression is good. So what I tell my young hockey players is it's okay. When you go out on the ice, you don't have to be nice. You don't have to share. And it's okay to be aggressive. In fact, I want you to be aggressive. I don't want you to be the kid that goes on on the ice and stands back and waits for things to be to happen to him or for him. If you don't go out on the ice and take, you cannot give and provide to your group of people, your cohort, your team, and then you will not be an asset to your team and your team won't enjoy the spoils of victory. And boys love competing. To dissuade boys from competition is another big mistake. What does this all come to? Well, think about it this way. If we don't have young boys and young men who are masculine, who have masculine traits and don't go out and take, share and give, then we'll invite or we'll leave open the door for other cultures with strong men who will take over. That's a certainty. We've seen this every time we've had immigration policies that invite in strong cultures. The strong cultures outcompete the weak cultures and replace them and then replace them with strong masculinity. It's not a mystery that women are attracted to these other immigrant strong cultures because women are attracted to the polar opposite. You know, I receive comments all the time about women looking for husbands that are similar to me. And I'm going to take that as a compliment. Thank you. And I know it has nothing to do with how I look. It's just the character that is attractive to women. Now, women aren't going to go tell you to be masculine. In fact, they're going to tell you to be feminine. They're going to tell you, I like men who are honest and kind and gentle. But that's not true. Women like men who are aggressive and masculine, who are kind to them and who give to them. Let that sink in. It's a big difference. So, I mean, I don't want to turn this into a political kind of thing, but the kind of comments that I'm getting from the viewers are such that it needs to be addressed. Um, I get the comments on the porcupine. Why are you going out and killing a porcupine? It's not something you need to do. Why kill a bear? You know, why take too much in a wilderness living situation or wilderness living challenge? You guys have too much. Why? Well, guys, girls, do you not have freezers? Do you not have access in your freezers right now? It's for the future. We didn't go out and waste any of that. Jeremy ate that for the next few weeks. So that was another common thing that we're, we're too aggressive. We were taking too much. We weren't sharing, but we were sharing. We brought all that meat home. We, we deliberately shared it with uh, family and friends and our kids and we ate it ourselves. Because we had access, we became attractive to women the polar opposite of femininity. So it's not, it's not a bad thing to go out and hunt. It's not a bad thing to be aggressive and it's not a bad thing to go out into nature and take. Taking is how we give as men and that will be rewarded. That's the big secret. And like I said before, people are not gonna encourage you to do that. Men won't encourage you to do that, which is kind of sad. I'm going to encourage you to do that because I think I'm thinking in your best interest. 
and I'm telling you it's okay. And the reason that society doesn't tell it, tell you to do that sort of thing is because, uh, well, women don't tell you because they're not going to give you the secret keys to their heart. They're just going to pick the winners and they're going to test the losers to see what kind of fortitude that they have. And I can tell you first off, uh, having a YouTube channel is a test of your fortitude, especially how YouTube rewards uh, masculinity these days. It's been punishing it pretty rigorously. And I'm not saying that not a lot of other people on YouTube are getting the same kind of, uh, you, you know, treatment and uh, test of their, their mental fortitude. But, uh, you know, they are testing you and they're testing your strength. So when, when women make comments, when people make comments, they're testing your fortitude. And the best thing to do is just double down. I mean, look at look what I've done. I've doubled down, tripled down. I'll call Drupadon. I am not going to back down from a fight. I never have. And then when you fight more against me, then I'm just going to double even more, double my efforts even more. I'm not going to back down from a fight, and you shouldn't either. So go out, get yourself a gun, and uh, you know, go shoot something. If you if you don't want to go with a gun because it's it's pro it's prohibitive to get involved in in shooting sports and and gun and gun hunting and you can get yourself a recurve bow, you can get yourself a cross, uh, crossbow, compound bow, you know, baby step, slingshot. That doesn't work for you, get a fishing rod. Go fishing, you can't go get a fishing rod, it's too much money. Buy yourself a $6 uh, roll of fishing line and some hooks and go hand line fishing. And then catch those little junk fish that are super easy to catch and, and uh, cook them. And get your boys and your buddies out there and do it with you. It's really fun to, to mess around a campfire and uh, cook a meal, let me tell you. And that's exactly how I started messing around, cooking a meal. So I got a few more things here, just give me a second. So I've got a reader comment, and this reader comment really struck me because it was a person who asked a question, a legitimate question, instead of making all these blanket statements and accusations, he asked a question. He said, okay, it's good, it's really good. Okay, listen, I must ask, he says, as an overly privileged, middle-class raised American, how do I transition from being a spoiled, only eating what I see in a package, to, well, you guys? I just came across this and I've been so far amazed, touched, and inspired to get to this level of absolute open-mindedness and one with nature, as one would say. I do not see myself sleeping anytime soon. Off to the next video. He asked a question. I mean, when I was young, that's what we did. We just assumed that people that are older than us knew stuff, and they did. People that are, have more experience know more stuff, so you ask them questions. So thanks for asking the question. I won't mention you by name in case you don't want to be recognized, but feel free to drop your name down below and say, hey, that's me, I wrote that. Um, but, I mean, asking the question means that you're already there. You've already got the framework to understand where we're headed with this. I'm not going to tell you you got to watch all my videos to figure it out, I think the best way to figure it out is just to go out and do it. Honestly. Okay. So I wrote down a few more notes because I wanted to hit everything on this topic. I would want to have to revisit it. Um, so what if your wife or girlfriend won't let you go out and hunt? Just get another one. <laughs> I'm dead serious. If, uh, if your wife or girlfriend doesn't respect your masculinity, go. I had a buddy who said, I, I really want to go duck hunting. I'm like, dude, go duck hunting. He's like, no, my, my girlfriend won't let me. My wife won't let me. Well, what do you think happened to him? The dude's divorced. He got divorced because his, he, he was not a man and his wife wanted a man. And, and, and your wife wants you to say, no, I'm gonna go hunting, I'll be back. And you know what happens when you get back from hunting? Your wife loves you again because you've been away and in your absence, you've grown, you've grown into a bigger man than, she, than you were when you left. This is gonna be a long commentary, but I hope you enjoy it. Uh, share your bounty, be a provider. Um, the hunters that I know um, that are married, are, they stay married. They've got it inside themselves to be aggressive in hunting and then and aggressive in life. Um, teachers, okay, I wanna address teachers. So when my son was in kindergarten, I have two stories here, bear with me. F feel, free to, feel free to quit this video anytime, but if you're enjoying this, Drop some comments down below and let's have a discussion. Anyway, so I had a teacher in, in, uh, in um, kindergarten, so first primary, and uh, I, 
I knew my son was into guns, and so preemptively, I, when they had their walk open house, I wanted to go, go in and ask. Uh, so, what are your policies on guns? If the if you see the young boys are you know four or five years old, uh, what are, what happens if you, you see them playing little gun games? She said, "Well, we try to divert their attention to something else." And I said, "Why? Why is that?" And she said, "Well, you know, we want them to play other things." I said, "Well, like house, like with dolls and stuff." She's like, "No, just other things." I'm like, "So, what's wrong with guns?" She's like, "Well, you know, we just dissuade them from doing." It. She had no answer. So. I pressed on a little bit more and I asked, well, you know, I, I have guns at home and I think guns are okay. And she's like, well, listen, okay, it's not, it's not my personal uh, opinion about guns, it's board-wide policy. And I said, well, I don't agree with board-wide policy. So just so you know, I let my son play, play pretend guns and I think it's okay. So we left it at that. It was never an issue because I think she understood and I explained to her more about the difference between boys and girls. And she, it never occurred to her that boys and girls were different. And over the years, I hear anecdotes about how this teacher has, has changed her perspective and policies about dealing with boys and girls and treats them differently. I, say, I explained to her that boys are aggressive, they're more rough and tumble, they, uh, they play more aggressively. And she took that to heart and she's changed her policies about how to do things. Another example um, is my son, we're gonna have to deal with a plane here now, the son, my son uh, is in grade three now and uh, another squirrel calling me and he was drawing pictures of a tank as part of an, ass an assignment. They said, P open a magazine and recreate what you see as an image in there as, a, as an exercise for art. So of course he went, he found a t picture of a tank in a, in a book and he started drawing it. Well, this was a supply teacher and didn't she say, stop drawing a tank choose something else, it's inappropriate. And, uh, you know, of course, my son didn't come home and say this to me, but, you know, we have a, a before bed uh, conversation every night, and I ask him, any problems at school? Do you want to talk to anything about anything? Do you want to, anything concerning you, et cetera, et cetera? Open door. Just mention it. We won't value judge. We'll just talk about it. And oftentimes, he'll, he'll let me know about problems. So he told me the teacher got him in trouble uh, for drawing a tank. I said, well, what did you say? He said, well, I just, I picked something else to draw. And I asked him if it was okay to draw tanks. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, why do you think she had problems with you drawing tanks? And he didn't have an answer. And I said, well, she probably doesn't understand the difference between a real tank and a fake tank. He's like, that's crazy. Of course she understands the difference. He's like, well, maybe she, maybe she doesn't understand that you understand the difference. He's like, well, maybe. And I said, isn't that kind of curious? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, what would you do next time? And he didn't really have an answer. Because boys don't have the communication skills that girls do. They just don't. And it takes them a long time to get to the point where you're like me and you can just talk forever. But uh, it's a skill that boys have to learn to be able to express themselves in their position. And I had a hard time when I was a kid being a boy. And I'm sure everybody watching this had had problems as a boy too, explaining in their position and their masculinity too, of uh, mostly feminine culture and female teachers. So anyway, he didn't have an answer and he still has trouble and maybe I'll air at the end, but I had a conversation again, what, what should you say? And the answer is, um, I'm not drawing a real tank. This is a pretend tank. There is a difference between a real tank and a pretend tank. Do you understand the difference? That's the proper response. And then you carry on with what it is that you do. And if the teacher wants to take you down to the principal's office, so be it but you stand up for your masculinity. That's right, you stand up for yourself and you double down. And I'm not asking you to pick fights, but I'm asking you to stand up for what you believe in and the world is gonna be a better place because then we won't be ripe for invasion. That's a long story. Um, there's a difference between men and women when it comes to nurturing. Okay, so men and women nurture differently. For men, we are killers. We are designed to be killers. We are designed with the ability to outsmart wild game. That's why we're here, plain and simple. There's a lot of women who do not understand that and they get really upset when we kill to provide. But that's how men nurture. Men nurture and feed by killing. We go out and we kill things so that we can nurture our families. Women do it completely differently and it's not bad and it's not bad how men do it, it's different. And both are necessary in order to be successful and have a successful family. Men need to be aggressive. Women care and nurture by taking care of the family, 
by taking that food that's been killed by men who have taken the brunt of the burden and they feed their children with that. If, you didn't, if we didn't have that, if we didn't have that in our DNA through our evolution, we wouldn't be dominant over every corner and aspect of this world. It simply would not be that way. So men and women care differently. So occasionally I get comments down below, How did, why did you kill that cute bunny? And then they flag the video. I killed the bunny so that I could eat it and then so if I killed an extra one, I could bring it home and feed my family. And if we killed a lot of them, then we can have a big family. But I guess the rules are different. If you were hungry, you'd think differently. Put it that way. Uh, just about zero tolerance, zero tolerance um, boys it hurts uh, disproportionately because boys are boys. They're aggressive, they play, they fool around. You know, I don't get my, my, my son in trouble for the first time, even in the first three or four times. I give them the benefit of the doubt and we just sit down and have a conversation. I don't have zero tolerance for, for anything he does. He's a smart, a rational boy. He understands um, rational, logical conversations as all boys do. All you have to do is tell him why. We do it this way because, you know, we don't poke somebody in the eye when we're wrestling because it hurts. We don't scratch and bite, um, you know, when we're playing because then other people won't want to play with us anymore. That's all you have to say. Uh, boys get it. You just have to, sometimes you have to explain to them more than once. Tell them what the results are. Tell them why we're doing it. I'm, I'm serious. It works almost every time. Um, as far as like comments that people are leaving on my channel, it doesn't bother me. Again, I have, uh, I, I've rarely deleted a comment. I think I've deleted a couple comments when they're about my wife, like totally inappropriate stuff, right? You don't need to be rude. Um, you know, my wife can defend herself, but I, I'm not going to expose her to that kind of abuse. I mean, she's not, she's not on here for that kind of thing, right? She's on here incidentally. So that's the only time I don't delete comments. But if you ever want to come into my house, which is my YouTube channel and shake my cage and wonder if I can take it, go for it, man. Go for it. Have at her, buddy. Um, I assure you that no matter how much you shake my cage, uh, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get to me or bother me. I mean, I've heard it all. I've heard it all. I read every single comment so far and, uh, nobody's managed to shake my cage to the point where I've just exasperated. I've heard everything. I've heard everything, every single comment. So, I mean, it doesn't bother me going to shake my cage. And to me, that's just a test of my masculinity. Do I have what it takes? I do. Go, keep going, and bother me. Um, and then uh, I, I, I want to say, I want to say at one point I decided that um, I was not going to follow mainstream anything anymore. And that's kind of why I took the direction with the YouTube channel. I've never gone mainstream. I've never followed the rules. Um, the rules never were never meant for me. And the most successful people don't follow the rules either. They find little loopholes to take advantage of what's going on around them. It's true. Think about it. So breaking the rules and not looking at things exactly how the rest of the world does is an asset. So I don't intend to start following the rules, but um, at a certain point, I, this channel will evolve uh, with me and with my interests. So right now, I happen to be focused a lot on hunting. Um, probably going to switch over to fishing not too not too long and then uh, do some more trips too because I, I can't repeat things over and over again I want to be excelling and right now I've I've let hunting go and small game go for a long time and I'm um, just revisiting it now and I'm having a lot of fun doing it so uh, future plans um, I wrote some things down so and I just mentioned them fishing trap uh, tripping uh, maybe some trapping um, I do need a little bit of a break from the YouTube politics. It's hard to keep these uh, these videos up and I have to be really careful because again, we're in a feminized world right now where masculinity is not in favor. So the, uh, you know, the blood and gore is just something that YouTube just can't stand and can't deal with. And the average viewer can't stand to deal with either. And so, you know, I'm having to be careful about that and uh, I'm finding that it's not exactly super necessary to tell the story that I'm trying to tell. And uh, so we're going to see a little bit less of that.
Uh, I just want to mention that YouTube took down my hair hunt, my snowshoe hair hunt. It was It was doing really well. It had half a million views. It was getting 20,000 views uh, a month. It was doing really, really, really well. Um, they took it down. Uh, they really smashed it too. Not only did they age restrict it, but they, they had problems with the tags. Uh, there's metadata that you put down at the bottom of your video uh, that you guys can't see, but it helps people find the, ch the, uh, the uh, video and it has the search terms in there. So I don't know, I mean, there was nothing wrong with the tags that I could see. I did change them to help, you know, get YouTube to approve it, but uh, so far they haven't. We'll see if that gets back up. But uh, to me, it's like probably some people at YouTube didn't like the video. Um, and you know, you ever, you come across anti hunters all the time and there's no reason they're, they're not in YouTube and running the show at YouTube. So they did, uh, completely make it private and it's to the point where I can't make it public anymore. So the way YouTube works is they, uh, they'll often, they'll make it to limited ads or no ads. So age restricted means no ads and no one below or above or below 18 can watch it, but they do, uh, they can penalize you so badly. And in this case they did that's private. And uh, so it's in kind of purgatory where nobody can watch it. But uh, I think there's only a couple other videos that got age restricted, but most of them just get demonetized, meaning they can't make any money, which I'm fine with. And YouTube's been really good and tolerant about um, alternate ideas. And they haven't, uh, they've always allowed videos to be exposed, except for this hair hunt, which is kind of curious. But uh, I mean, you know, whatever. We'll figure that out. We'll get to the bottom of it. But YouTube doesn't censor things like I think people think it does. It just takes the money away. Um, I think that's a form of censorship because, you know, if you penalize people by taking their money away, they don't have any funding to continue doing it. So it is a form of censorship. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm not a conspiracy person. I'm not going to, I don't think that, you know, they're trying to out to stop this uh, kind of thing. I think they probably want to steer YouTube away from it, which is why they're chasing the money away from this, supporting this kind of content. Um, but I'm going to do my best to work through it. I'm, like I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to back down from a fight. Okay, that's it. That's all I got. I was probably pretty long, but uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope uh, if you do like this sort of thing, let me know down in the comments and I'll, I'll keep the next one shorter. I just, there was a lot of things that were building up that I wanted to get out there. Um, but I have other ideas for, uh, chats at the end. If you, if you have something you guys want, just let me know. We'll call it like a trailside chat and, uh, I can address some issues and do, maybe do some shout outs to people. And, uh, you know, I can answer in a more broad stroke fashion, some of the questions and concerns and comments that more, the, the more usual ones. And I could just tag it on at the end of a video. So let me know what you guys think. And, uh, as always like comment and subscribe. I never say that. <laughs> Subscribe or don't, I don't care. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thank you.